ladies and gentlemen, uh, can we have our seats? Welcome everybody uh, to this meeting of Regeneration and Enlightenment. Um, and I invite the members to declare any peculiar interests or other interests that you might have. I'll be glad to be interested in the members of Thanks, Jane. Anita? Um, Chair, I'd like to declare an interest in the notice of promotion and agenda item for as a member of the planning committee and also um, on page 41 um, there is an item which is objective 2.05 um, which is um, promoting the availability of support to establish the feasibility of on-farm anaerobic digestion plants and this is actually on planning committee on Thursday not you know, generally as a local item so although it won't impact on my judgments on the evening about whether or not I support it or not, I just wanted to bring that to the attention of the committee. Thank you very much, Steve. Yeah, um, thank you, Chair. Uh, prejudicial uh, interest in item 4, I urge you my membership of the Fire and Rescue Authority. Um, the same as Steve, item 4, I'm a member of the Mississauga Fire and Rescue Authority, so it's a prejudicial interest for me. Thank you. Members, please um, let us know that there's nobody being subject to the party whip. That's a nice, nice thing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so we go on to. Um, now, I'm, I'm aware that there's quite a few people at the back um, who are here. For the, for the item, item number four, the proposal um, about the fire station and the green belt land. So, um, if it's okay with the committee, I would propose that we bring that one before Mersey travel and we deal with it now. Is that okay with the rest of the committee? Thank you. So, can I invite um, the other minister, George? Well, I was at the last meeting, so can you um, declare the minutes are all correct? Yes. Thank you. So, item item four, um, can I ask Councillor Blakely to come forward with his proposal? Uh, his... And just to remind you that um, it's ten minutes.
On response time, there's a, there's a little bit of confusion there because all the public meetings I went to, the chief fire officer said to that response time. It's not the public meetings he said, let's not get hung up on response time. So very, very concerned that the message has gone to the chief fire officer, we're to say the least mixed and confused. And I don't think anybody at any public meeting got the same words other than we need this fire station. So it's to give him what he says the best response times to work the best rural residents, the, the protection he believes is necessary. Yet, Chairman, the last two years, West KB, he says, and these are his words, has only been operational for 50% of the time. And so he's covering West Rural from Upton without any problems and has been the last two years. In fact, five fighters I talked to on the doorstep tell me to all intents and purposes, West KB Fire Station is not operational at all. And of course, what about the most at risk sites every moves from Upton, which is our park hospital? The response times to that vulnerable site would be extended. So why the need to move a mile at a cost of over four million pounds? Assuming the chief fire officer is right and he needs a new fire station for whatever reason, why does it have to be our precious green belt? A green belt that has kept that this council has historically defended to the hills. Green belt to the cordons of the very eminent Dr. Hilary Ash, honorary conservation officer for Bill Wildlife and the Woodland Group of Cheshire Wildlife Trust, who says the proposed site is used as foraging for barnhouse, who are nesting on the north side of Southern Macedonia. <coughs> who says that bats are feeding here? Who says that kingfishers are reported in the area? Who says that if some of the green belt is lost here, it would affect that these species of protected wildlife, along with a commoner wildlife? Surely this committee and council do not want to be responsible for neglecting its biodiversity duties. Moving on, it's come to light there's been an ongoing string of emails. I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Brace for this because he got all these emails. And I will say a long string of emails, as you can see, these are now here. So thank you, Mr. Brace, for your tenacity in getting those emails. <coughs> the emails are between se senior fire officers and senior council officers, including senior planning officers. Therefore, it's no wonder that local people perceive that this is a done deal. But, Chairman, members, for the avoidance of doubt, I'm not saying that there has been any deals done. I'm simply expressing views said to me by many residents who I represent. And given the evidence, we can blame them. One of those emails was from Kieran Timmins. He was Deputy Chief Exec. I hear he's retired. I don't know whether he's quite gone, so I'll refer to him as the current Deputy Chief Exec of New South Fire and Rescue Service to Council. Officers talked about sites that have been discounted and sites considered in more detail. According to Mr. Timmins' email, six sites were considered in more details. However, according to him, there were only two runners left. Sorghum Massey Bypass, which is not the Green Dot site currently proposed, and the Library Community Hall sites in Greasby. Now, having had the Greasby site withdrawn by the leader of the council, one has to ask why the other front runner, the second choice at Sorghum Massey Bypass, described by Mr. Timmins as owned by Royal Council and looks quite positive based on recent correspondence. Was, was not then turned to instead of a brand new green belt site that has never been in the mix previously. This site that we're talking about tonight has never been in the mix until Greasby was withdrawn. Where and how did council officers suddenly identify a brand new site? And this isn't the case of Nibiris. The site on Sorgamassi Road, the bypass, is still in the northwestern Sorgamassi Road. The site on Sorgamassi Road up to bypass, like the Greasby site, is not in green belt. And while it's wanted, I checked with council officers, there are no tree preservation orders on any of the trees. In fact, one senior council officer said the site would already have its own perimeter buffer with the trees that are already in situ. So, Chairman and members, here is a council owned site that is not in green belt, that is described by Mr. Timmins as looking positive. So, the chief fire officer assertions that there are no alternative sites clearly is incorrect. <laughs> Now I know the committee may say this is something the Willows Planning Committee should a planning application be submitted. However, this committee can act before that in sending a message to Council and the Fire and Rescue Service and that this committee recommends to, to Council that this committee ask Council to maintain its protection from its green belt as set by new policy to stop inappropriate developments. Ask Council not to give sell or lease the land concerning this massive because of the value it has to the community 
And that's the council's continuing work to work cooperatively with the New South Wales Rescue Service in identifying and facilitating a more suitable site for operational purposes and to maintain the needs of local people. And, and in closing, Chairman, I'll just say that site is available. It's 600 metres from this site that we're discussing tonight. It will add nothing or very little to the response time to Chief Fire Officer. There's been quoting maybe 15 or 20 seconds either way, 15, 20 seconds closer to Upton, 15, 20 seconds further away from West David Buddy. And one final thing, Chairman, that, that wasn't in my initial thing, but given the floods we had last week and the horrendous scenes we had in Norton, with over 100 families displaced, that field, that green belt, was also underwater to the brook. By building on that field, you are taking away natural drainage. You are assisting the freak weather conditions that are becoming more and more frequent to flood that area. So, Chairman, I would ask that this committee fully supports the notice of motion that was uh, put forward to council, put moved to this committee, and sends those messages back to the council. Thank you for your time, Chairman. Members. Thank you, Councillor Blakely. Is there any questions from any members?
through the uh, previous minutes. Unfortunately, I've missed that. Uh, all I can say is that at the present moment, like uh, Councillor Briggs, I need to find out more information because stuff comes to light through emails that have been released. We're talking about plan deals, swaps, all sorts of things. I need to know the background of all this information prior before I make any decision at all in relation to what was proposed here before. Thanks, Dave. Ron. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, I mean, I'm um, just going to reiterate what was said by a comment on Dave. Uh, we're talking here about um, response signs and we're talking about um, professional judgments and, and really. Um, whereas I do accept the arguments about green belts and the biodiversity of, 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 the, of the area, you know, um, and that's certainly an issue that I take seriously, Chris, as well. And, you know, I'm pleased that you've raised that point to me, but at the same time, we're talking about an emergency service that has made a decision, and I really feel that they should prove to us and give us the information how they've reached that decision and chosen one side of the Baptist Asia, <clears throat> that's the last piece of power to make it. Uh, with the notice of motion, which has been in existence now for some weeks, uh, coming before this committee, and one was somebody has been unable to anticipate that there would be suggestions put forward, the evidence put forward, which would show that the wrong side had been chosen mm -hmm. and that others were obeyed. I'm absolutely amazed that nobody made any attempt. Being here tonight, the fire officers from the right hand of the fire, the authority, uh, which was a short, short of all of this, with that the vote was uh, being declared to us before they vote, uh, an opinion, which mm -hmm. was denied the council, which I can come here tonight. And I certainly like an explanation, if not on the but from the matter of fact, if they were aware of this, why did they hear that? Because they're simply delayed the right of people to have that this be done by the proper body. Okay, thanks, John. I take I take that that on board. Um, so can we delay the, the the recommendation tonight and we can get the fire officer come to our next meeting and tell us that maybe the process has moved on from there. I mean, the, the, there's no planning application being sent in as yet. So we, it's not time that we lack. I think it's due diligence. And we are, I, I agree with, with Rob, we are talking about life and death here. It is, it is a very um, important emotive subject. And, and taking on board the amount of of uh, people who attended the meetings and, and the, uh, the hostility, if you like. But I would like to hear from the fire service before we, we send any recommendations through. And it, 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 we're not pressured by time. Oh, we are. Oh, uh, well. Thank you, Chair. Sorry. Please be the original preferred site, but that was withdrawn. Can I just say that this is a private meeting held in public and I would ask you not to not to interrupt please, but just just listen, please. Thank you Chair. Uh, I think it's important that we look at actually what's being asked. I mean I don't think it's uh, beyond our remit to ask the council to protect our green belt or to even to ask our officers to work with the fire authority. We're asking them to go and deal with the fire authority, not for us to make the decision on behalf of the fire authority. We just want our council officers to go and do that on our behalf. And I think that that would be something that this committee could decide tonight. It's not for us to decide whether the fire authority's professional opinion is right or wrong. It's just to ask our officers to engage with them and ask them to think again. I think that's what, what the spirit of the uh, notice of motion is to, to ask them to take a look at the decision that they've taken and explore some alternatives. And I think there's no reason why we couldn't make that decision without hearing the fire authority to use in person. Thanks, thanks, Anne. This motion stands, and it is the duty of this committee to look at these things and make recommendations.
But as I've said before, I think it would be wise of this committee, as well as listening to what uh, Councillor Blakely had to say, to listen to the fire, what the fire authority have got to say, and then we make a recommendation. But it is the responsibility of this committee to make recommendations, and I think it would it, it wouldn't be in our interest or the general public's interest or the council's interest to make a decision when we hope when we've only heard one one part of the argument. Sorry, Jerry, can I just come back on that? I don't think I was saying that we're making a decision. You can't, then we're going to wrap it up. We are not going to wrap it up. I don't think I was saying that we're not making a decision. I think what I'm saying here is this does not force a decision on the fire authority. It would still be for the fire authority to present their plan and yeah. so on. Yeah, that, 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 that was my point. Okay. Um, Michael. I'm, I'm going to wrap, wrap it up now. If you want to make just a, a quick comment. Steve, you can only make a recommendation and you second it, but we could, we could have a yeah. vote on that. Well, I, I'm sure that there's nothing in this resolution here no. that's going to stop the, the process going as it is. No. I, I would think we should definitely support this resolution. Let's put foot forward to nice. Okay, well, we, we've, got, we've got a resolution in front of us and it's been seconded by Jeff. So if we, if we put it to the vote, all those in favour of the recommendation. All those against? Abstentions? I am abstaining. I, I thought I gave a very clear reason why at the beginning when I made my speech. We need a lot more information in relation to what's going on prior to any of these discussions taking place. So, what was the answer? So, what was the So um, we'll, we'll um, invite the head of the fire service here for the next meeting. We'll listen to what the fire service have got to say, and then we'll make a res recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we go back to item three, and if somebody. Goes, now we go back to item three, which is mercy travel, and um, Mark, we're going to say a few words. Okay. Okay, Mark. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, I think members will remember from the uh, last uh, last meeting that. Committee requested some high level background information regarding the transport levy. Uh, so, we have a report in your, in your papers tonight that, uh, that provides just that. Um, members will be aware that uh, Mercy Travel are the executive who are responsible for the delivery of public transport services across Merseyside and uh, across the city region. And uh, in the year that we're in, 2015-16, um, the transport levy was just over £26 million approved by the Liverpool City Region Combined Authority uh, back in February, March time. Um, I'm really pleased to advise that uh, Mersey Travel colleagues are here uh, joining us today, Chair. We have uh, John Fogarty, uh, who I think may come forward and just say a few words. So John is the uh, Director of Resources and 151 Officer uh, at Mercy Travel uh, and he's, uh, he has Assistant Tracy Gibson with him here today uh, and I think uh, John just wanted to uh, provide some context for the uh, benefit of the committee in relation to the Thank you. Thank you. Um, is this the silver one? Silver one. Pull it towards you. Thank you. Um, thank you for the paper and obviously thank you for, for, for the interest. I just want to take a couple of minutes to just put that levy issue into context and explain a little bit around what that funds at Mersey Travel. Um, it's worth stressing, however, that, that 
not how it it's just worth stressing that it's the combined authority now with the new governance arrangements for the city of <coughs> that sets the transport levy. Now, if it happens, I'm also the treasurer of the combined authority. Um, but it's the combined authority, as in the, the six leaders, but it's actually five leaders, because Halton don't participate in the, in the levy, that the, the set the levy. Um, now, while each of the district collects that each district collects that levy, it passes it through to the combined authority. Um, the combined authority doesn't, however, pass all of it through to Mersey Travel. It can decide how much of it to pass through to Mersey Travel. So, at the moment, it retains some for certain running costs associated with the combined authority. It also retains some to repay some of the debt that couldn't that had to be that couldn't go over to Mersey Travel under the change of governance, but had to reside with the combined authority. And it also retains some of its income for transport infrastructure investment. Um, and again, having said that Mersey Travel doesn't get all of the levy, what Mersey Travel gets is, is an operating grant from the combined authority for those functions that the CA wish Mersey Travel to conduct on its behalf. And principally, those would be the concessionary travel scheme for elderly and disabled people, which is the biggest chunk of the levy goes on that, that's probably about 50 or million pound a year. And um, also the provision of the supported bus network and the Mersey Link, which is kind of a dial the ride service that you may be familiar with. Um, that's for residents who live in communities or at times of day or have various characteristics that, that the commercial bus network doesn't satisfy. Um, there's travel, but some supplementary services called the supported bus network. Again, at considerable expense, that's around £25 million a year. Also, the levy funds the operation of travel centres across the city region, of which there are um, ones in each of the districts at least. Um, and that's also associated with providing travel information, timetables, all of that, uh, which actually, when you add it all up, is quite an expensive undertaking. The Mercy Ferries too, the Mercy Ferries is a public commuter service and the tourist attraction uh, that needs to be funded through the levy, as well as the direct operation of the ferries is a significant investment in obviously maintaining vessels to a, um, to a worthy state. And also, very significantly, the landing stages themselves are expensive to undertake, to, to maintain, keep in working order. And then there's obviously the various support charges that can come with any organisation of our size. Um, in addition, but outside of the levy mechanism, the CA obviously gets the tool toll income and passes on that income to Mersey Travel by way of an operating grant. Mersey Travel operate the tunnels but they don't receive the re they don't receive the revenue that's CA income because um, Mersey Travel counts on the assets that have to transfer to the CA um, when you change from the transport authority. We also get this is again outside of the levy 100 million pound a year um, ish to operate the rail network the Mersey rail network on behalf of the DFT. So that's a grant that comes from the Department of Transport every year. And we pass through to Mersey Rail principally, or a little bit goes to Northern Rail to do the parts of the network. Principally that goes to Mersey Rail um, because we're responsible for, well basically they're our contractor um, in operating that network. It's a, it's a very early form of devolution really, Mersey Rail. Mersey side is quite pioneering. Uh, it's only Mersey side and London that have that relationship with with operators, um, the rest of the franchises are held by the FT currently. Um, other parts of the country are trying to follow where we've led. Um, but both the levy and the Mersey Travel Grant have reduced significantly in recent years and will continue to reduce unless there's some you know, unanticipated change in the financial environment that we're all in. Um, We've had a financial strategy for at least the last three years that's been predicated on reducing the levy. Um, because of the situation everybody has found themselves in post 2010, um, 
we've had to work very closely with all of the district treasurers, including including Wirral, in establishing a levy that it provides um, adequate resources to fund transport priorities, but also takes into account the fact that the levy was becoming a bigger and bigger portion of council tax, basically, as your resources through revenue support grant were reducing. The levy had to reduce in proportion to that, otherwise it just ate up more and more of um, effectively the council tax bill. And it was, it was proven to be very destabilising. So working with the treasurers, we've identified um, a formula whereby the levy will reduce at the same rate as your revenue support grant reduces. And that has to be the average revenue support grant reduction across the city region rather than for each individual district. It's too difficult to do for each individual district because the levy can only be set based on population. So we, we have to take averages. Um, we weren't able to reduce the levy until this year because of a anomaly, with, anomaly within the council tax referendum regulations, which meant, weirdly, if we reduce the levy, it would trigger a council tax referendum for the rest of your, your non-levy, you know, your Wirral-based council tax. So we couldn't do that. Um, what we were able to do, though, was to provide a grant back to the districts in recognition of your responsibilities in terms of strategic highways and public, public transport. The Wirral, over the last two years, have had about two and a half million pound um, through that infrastructure grant. Now we've wrapped that up with a levy, with a levy reduction. It's much more simple. So it's not ring fenced. Um, we all can determine what the world wants to do with, with that levy reduction. It was 13 million pound across Merseyside, nearly 14 this year, of which about 3.2 was Wirral. And you can see that expressed on council tax bills. That was a reduction from 331 pound for a bandy equivalent that somebody was made from Merlin Travel last year, going down to £294 this year. Um, and our forecast is that that will reduce to £261 by 1890. Um, although that could change if revenue support grant is withdrawn faster or slower than, than, than we're calculating. So far, Mersey Travel's done that through a continued focus on efficiency and value for money rather than on any front-facing, customer-facing services, predominantly. Um, we've done it through better procurement, changing our management structures, and like everybody else, looking at our back office functions. To achieve the harder savings in years to come, just like yourselves, we're going to have to start looking at more tricky policy areas um, around the supportive bus network, uh, around our strategy for those ferries, around the information we provide to, to the travelling public travel centres. Well, thankfully, we think we can get much better outcomes for the money that we spend in transport by working with districts, by partnership working, by working with operators, um, <laughs> commercial operators. Basically, if we grow the market, then you know a rising tide lifts all boats equally. So we want to increase patronage on the bus network. If we do that, the bus operators will be able to commercially operate in areas of the Wirral and the Merseyside if we currently don't. So they win because they get commercial revenue and we win because we have to support that network. We have to begin withdraw our subsidies. Um, we need to be a little bit more smart than we, than we previously have done in our interventions um, on bus. A, an example of it that, that hopefully members will be familiar with and some members will be is the My Ticket product for younger people we introduced over the last year or so. We, we had a completely different financial model for that than we previously would have had. Rather than just pay the operators for every ticket they take, we, we pumped prime the market and we said, you take that, you, you operate My Ticket, you can get any money you can make from that. In the early years, if there's a, if, in the early months, if there's a loss, we will underwrite that loss to, to a capped amount. But we think once the market grows, you'll be making money on it and you won't need a subsidy. And that's what's happened. And that, that's proven to be a much more sustainable intervention in the market. The My Ticket product, particularly for the under 16s, has been a big commercial hit. 
with operators and has had a big impact on younger people. We've now moved it to recognise the increase in school leaving age to up to 19. That means a bigger financial commitment from Merseyside, Mersey Travel, but it is time limited and it's financially limited. Our, our support for that will withdraw in two years. But in fact, we'll withdraw it next year. But the operators are committed to keep the product. Um, I would, and that's an example of something I was conscious of as well. But this coincidentally, this afternoon, I was at um, Rural Summit for, for partnership working, um, and it seemed very much in, in line with what we're all doing in terms of um, you know, working with partnerships and concentration outcomes. So, you know, it's really pleasing and Mercy Travel are really pleased to be recognised as a key partner, not just in delivering the infrastructure and the transport elements of your, of your 20 pledges, but in terms of getting you know, more, more rounded approaches. Because we spend an awful lot of money in the world and it's important to make sure that we're all members and we're all offices and, and, and the wider we're all community. And you probably know better where some of that money should be spent than, than we do. So it's just working in partnership and we'll get the most out of that reducing levy. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions. Obviously, it's quite a wide ranging subject, so I'm not promising to be able to answer any, but answer all of them. Hopefully, I'll be able to answer some. But um, that was all I wished to say on the report. Uh, thanks, John. Thank you. Any members would like to? Uh, thank you, Chair. First of all, uh, as I missed the beginning, declared an interest that you have a travel pass, a disabled travel pass. Uh, that's not going to stop you from asking any questions. In sort of reading in the media, uh, the press this week, I noticed that ASU Rail made over £14 million profit, an increase on the profit that you made last year. Excellent thing, the whole thing, uh, Mersey Rail Network. Again, uh, the revenue that comes out of the tunnels, I take it that all goes back into uh, reducing the levy that we have to pay at the end. Well, well currently, um, strictly speaking, it doesn't currently um, because uh, it, it, it doesn't, the, 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 the surplus that the tunnels generate is currently. Um, is in an infrastructure investment fund, which uh, the CA have determined that that's available for transport infrastructure across the city region. And that, that surplus has been growing in the last couple of years at a higher rate, right? and, it, and perhaps it, it, as the economy picks up and more people use the tunnels. Now, um, whether tunnel surplus would be reduced, it would be used to reduce the levy in future would be a combined authority decision. But currently, if the tunnels are kept out of the levy mechanism, um, well, and again, that's, you know, changing that policy would be a decision of, of, of the CA. The other part, profit from the rail. The profit of the rail, the Mersey, Mersey Rail, are at risk for the Mersey Rail, rail network. So where the profit they generate, they retain in the same way that if they were to make a loss, which they did in the early years of the concession, um, well, certainly didn't make profits like this. It wasn't a successful concession before Mersey Rail took over. So they do, they do retain those profits. However, it's worth saying that Mersey Travel, or the taxpayer, um, does have a, have a share of those. There is a mechanism whereby um, part of those profits and those surplus comes back to the taxpayer uh, and, and that is not all of it but there is we do have a benefit share arrangement with them and that does make you know that does help keep you know, travels services lower than a little bit otherwise be. Mike could I just ask a question that I would want to ask that please. So that's a holder of um Mersey travel patch on the interest because you've got a push pack there yeah. <laughs>
Chair. Um, thank, thanks for the report, John. It's, uh, it's interesting to see that the government is spending £29 million. You know, we've never had it, or I've never heard of where it goes, and, and, and try to explain that. And I'm pleased to say I don't get a bus pass for another 18 months. <laughs> um, my question is on my ticket, uh, and it's been very popular, particularly in this. The, you mentioned about the 16 to 19 provision. You're going to stop it, but did you say that the operators are going to continue that? Yeah, that, that's the pledge. And if, if it works in the way it has done with the under 16s, then um, we, we all expect that it will continue. We can we can forecast, we can't predict with massive certainty what they will be, how they will behave in two years' time, or what the market will be like. But our you know our predictions, our research, the statistics we've got, and my conversations with the operators, they're quite well. The main operators, anyway, are quite. Um, Pleased with it. and you know, we have a financial commitment. We pay them um, some of the money this year, we'll pay them half that sum of money next year, and we'll pay them nothing the year after because by the year after they'll be making. See, what they need to in, three, in two years' time, it won't just be the 16 to 18, it'll be the 16 to 18 and the under 16s. If you add them all up together, we fully expect that that will definitely be a commercial. Uh, a commercially viable proposition for them. Thanks, Chair. Yeah. Um, I don't know what's past me there. <laughs> oh, I, I don't know if this is relevant to this, but while here, I think it's, uh, it's, it's appropriate that we ask. When all has no night service buses in Liverpool at the moment, um, there's just really come midnight. Anyone from the middle is isolated over, over in Liverpool, and the only way that they can get across now is by taxi. So, there is a discussion about reinstalling this service, bringing it back. Uh, I think there has been quite a lot of discussion. Um, where that's what I'm up to now, I'm not entirely certain. But what I would say that that, that night service was a commercial service and um, was withdrawn for commercial reasons. It wasn't a merger travel supported service. Where it gets a little bit confusing is that when the, when the commercial service drops off very quickly in the way that it did, merger travel does step in as it does anywhere for a certain amount of time just to transition. Um, but we don't have kind of an open-ended commitment to, to continue with it. So it, it's a commercial service that's serviced service that sees. Now I, I am aware that there's been discussions around the best way to re provide that service to get commercial operators interested in uh, in picking it up and if not how we could possibly intervene um, to you know for it to be re provided. But the answer is that the first answer needs to be a commercial, a commercially viable service. Now, whether that be with a bus or whether it be with a small vehicle, I'm not sure. But yeah, that, that conversation has been or is ongoing, and I'm quite happy to get somebody to, to contact if we were up to at the moment. Yeah, the dialogue that we've engaged in. Yeah. 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 Just that jungle scheme, and then I'll, I'll bring you in. John? It's only a quick bit of information, uh, Chair. Since my granddaughters became, became of age, given their activities, it might have already become financially viable, I'm not sure. 